www.mumsforthe4.com. I help busy mums make their lives easier with parenting tips, tricks, hacks and advice. And today we have got a Q&A all about autism. Um, now, autism is not, I'm not a doctor or anything, but I am a mum of a child with autism. Um, so although I am not like medically qualified in the field, obviously I know a fair amount about it. Um, I've had loads and loads of questions sent in, so I thought the easiest way to get through more would be to do a Q&A. So um, if you are watching on replay, hello, please type replay in the comments and I will catch up with you soon. If you have any questions of your own about autism, the diagnosis, anything at all really, anything autism related, um, please pop it into the comments. I will go through the questions I've already got and then I will try and get back to some. So, okay. My, fir the first question, where is the most sensible place to start? Okay, so, um, from what age can you see the signs of autism? And a few of these, I'll just read a few of these questions that we've already had. So, from what age can you see the signs of autism? And what autism signs could you, this is a separate question, what, could you see any autism signs in your son as a baby? If so, what were they? Okay, um, so, Will is now six. Um, we started the diagnosis process the June. He started school in um, Easter. Just because it's really brief round down a bit. We started the diagnosis process in the Easter after he started school. So Easter after his third birthday. So he was three in January. Then we started the diagnosis process. Um, yeah, so after Easter, I think June time, um, and then he was diagnosed before Christmas, which is record time. Now I had my concerns before that. When he was a very small baby, I'd say no. Um, there are no, there are sort of, there were no red flags at all. As he got a little bit older, there are lots of things that, as I look back, seem quite obvious. But at the time, could have been this, could have been that. Um, so it is, it's so difficult to tell, and so many of the things will either turn into nothing or turn into something, you know, um, which you can only hindsight's twenty twenty, isn't it? So. You can look back and see and know exactly like why didn't I think that was more obvious. You want some more? You want some raisins? Yeah. I've got Zara here with me. He's being very good, aren't you? Do you want to come and say hello to everyone quickly? Can you say hello? Hello! Say hello. She's a bit snotty because she's full of cold and she's got um she's teething. So anyway, but she's eating so she's happy for a minute. Right, so um the signs I could see as he was probably I'd say probably from about age one, so he was like a reasonably easy baby. As he got older, um, he was very, very reliant on me. So as long as he was with me all the time, he was absolutely fine, but he didn't really like other people much. Um, and I think I anticipated his needs so much that um, he was, you know, he was fine when he was with me. So it, the problem you get then is a lot of other people going, oh, is it you? Is it... Are you spoiling him? Are you doing this to him? Um, which I think is a, something a lot of parents with children with autism get that at some point they've said that they've had other people go, well, is it, you know, is there something that matter or is it just this is the way you're parenting them and you're spoiling them too much, you're doing this, you're doing that. So a few of the signs um, that now I can see when looking back sort of to look out for. Thank you, darling. Thank you. Um, a few of the totally, a few of the sort of quite broad General signs of autism would be not using eye contact very well, um, appearing distracted and sort of not to listen. Now, obviously, that could just be children, but and any one of these things could be part of the autism spectrum and could be absolutely nothing at all. This is why it's confusing. This is why it's complicated. Um, so lack of eye, eye contact. It could be sensory issues. So Will would be quite fussy about labels and things and zips and stuff perhaps from a little bit older than one, but that sensory issues of being very concerned about, you know, oh, this is not liking the label, and this, not liking this, and sort of, that kind of thing, um, can be a sign. Um, uh, a very specific thing that William used to do is called hand over hand, which um, no one brought up with me until afterwards, um, but whether you've heard of this, let me know in the comments if you've heard of this before. But hand over hand is rather than like, um, this toy is broken, mummy, you fix it, please. A child with autism might grab your hand and put it on it to try and fix it and use your hand more like a tool rather than bring it to you and ask you to deal with it. 
So William used to do that very much. He'd just, like pick up my hand and get my, try and get my hand to do something. Um, so that's quite a specific thing. But if your child's doing that as opposed to just bringing you something, it's probably worth speaking to your health visitor. Um, so other things that he used to do. I've got actually I've got a list of things here that I spoke to the health visitor about. Where is it? Grab this earlier. This was my list from at the time of things that were that he was doing. His, uh, this, these are the things that I wrote down at the time. Because quite frankly, I've forgotten most of them. Um, okay, so I've got here. William often says what an adult would say. Um, so yeah, so he used to say to me. Rather, he would say, "Have you finished?" Not, "I have finished." So um, around the time he was two, you know, most. Ch- what you'd expect most children to say, I finished, finished. He would just repeat the exact words that an adult would say. Um, so a lot of, and he would use a lot of what they call scripted speech. So rather than using spontaneous language, and again, this is this is not all children with autism, this was my child with autism. Um, rather than using spontaneous language, as in saying what you need to say and using the words and just communicating them, he would use lines that he'd heard from other places. So they might be lines that I would use, such as, have you finished? Or they might be entire lines from Peppa Pig or um, from Elmo that he was really, really into. And he would recite lines of that and use those to communicate. So um, he'd say, Elmo loves you or something rather than I love you. Or, you know, that kind of just, you know, random example. But that he would use these um, lines he'd heard from other people and spit and sort of spout them out word for word as opposed to using his own spontaneous language. So that is another sign. Um, and like I said, if if your child is showing any of these signs, it does not mean they have autism. If they're not showing these signs, it doesn't mean they don't have autism. But my main advice to you would be, if you have any concerns at all, speak to your health visitor. Because as a parent, you're too close to it anyway. Even if you, as a parent, were an autism specialist, you'd still need someone else to look at your child because you're so close to it. You can't get that distance to really see, is this all in my head or am I missing something? So um, speak to your health visitor. If you're at all worried, get a referral because they will never die. Having been through the process, they will never, ever diagnose a child who does not have autism. It's such like a lengthy, like detailed process. The diagnosis process was amazing, actually. The, the sort of the random of the things that they did, you know, they put a Lightning McQueen car under a blanket and they'd lift it up and check his reaction and things. And all these little things uh, sort of slotted together to, to form a diagnosis, which you just, you can't just know as a parent. So all you can do is, if you've got concerns, speak to your health visitor, get a referral and let the professionals do the diagnosis or not. Right, okay. So the other things that William would do that were kind of red flags... Um, appeared selectively deaf, which again, all my children do that, but that's what he was doing. Um, he re- ignore requests of others and be too focused on whatever he was doing. Yeah, so that is still very much a thing. He's six now and he's very, this is what I'm doing. Very, very focused, very kind of specific, obsessive. Um, so he would uh, know all of the Thomas the Tank, like every single Thomas the Tank and um, all the names of all of them, just by glancing at them from a very young age. Um, and his maths has always been very good. His reading's always been very good. Um, but it does, you know, but his spontaneous, his spontaneous language wasn't. Um, at the moment, it's Alton Towers. He's obsessed with Alton Towers. He knows all the facts about Alton Towers when every ride opened, when every ride closed. You know, when the corkscrew closed and they replaced it with some other roller coaster and what the map looked like in 1986. And blows my mind a bit but um he's you know he retains all this in his head and he's he's got these very very specific specific um interests so he it's a very very specific and kind of niche interest could be a sign of autism but again could just be your child's very much into something they've got out of it only professionals will be able to tell you so uh, what else we pick here? At birthday parties and play groups, he had little interest in what the other children were doing. Yeah, he really did show li- very little interest in other children. He, I used to think he was interested in me at the time. I think he just he needed me there. Um, he wasn't necessarily even that interested in what I was doing, but he did want me there um, as a sign of comfort. He really was not that interested in other people. Um, 
and he's got, I've changed, he tends not to look at whoever's speaking to him even if he's listening. So again, that might be a case. So maybe your child has heard you, but is not necessarily looking at you in order to listen to you. Now, he didn't do a lot of the things which can be associated with autism, which would be like hand flapping, which is called stimming. Um, so a lot of children would um, uh, do sort of things like hand flapping to sort of try and calm themselves. Um, Will doesn't do much of that, and he does have autism, he has moderate autism. He would like a drink, good girl. Um, he has focused on unusual interests, yes, all this kind of stuff that I put in these. This, so this was the form, this was the, the initial um, contact that was the beginning of the diagnosis process. Um, if any of you, by the way, um, want any more information of this, I could, you know, if you want to see any of these things, then I'm quite happy to send. Um, send you copies of this kind of stuff if it is helpful because really I was at the beginning of the diagnosis process just looking for all the help yeah. I was so grateful for any help I was given so you know more than happy to kind of pass that on um yeah so next question I think these those were the main sort of red flags if you like when he was younger he be, um, just became um increasingly focused on certain things and his development is what they called spiky. So this is one of the main, main things they look at with autism is if they've got, they're doing very, very well in other things and really not so well in other things. So in, um, when he was age three, he had like, I don't know, reading age of six, but um, a communication spontaneous language age of one. So if all his stuff was high or all his stuff was low, then it wouldn't necessarily indicate autism, but because this development was so very spiky, then that was a bit of telltale so uh right so they some of the signs hopefully that's helpful let me know in the comments um or if you need to know anything else right dealing with change okay so how i've got a um, question from claire um dealing with change repetition of movement um and stimming so dealing with change the biggest thing is plan 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 so i think it's Part of the reason Will is now doing so well is because I'm naturally, I have to be quite organised because I've got four children and I don't really have a choice, excuse me. I don't really have a choice other than to be quite organised because I literally would not pick up, all my children would be left in school and they would never eat if I was not organised. So by because my day is very, very planned out, that suits William and he does better. But because, so but equally I have had to make my days more structured and more planned and do more planning to suit William. So we've, you know, we help each other. Um, but the more planning you can do, the more the children with autism know what is coming. If a change is coming and you can prepare them for it, they're going to cope with it a lot better. So um, a big example would be when he moved from nursery up to reception. I was very worried it was going to be a new classroom, a new teacher, new toilets. Who's going to have to eat lunch in school? Who's going to be there all day? A much bigger playground, a lot less you know, baby really, in nursery, they're really babies, aren't they? Um, they just learn how to be in school, and then they go into reception, they're expected to do a lot more. So I was really worried about that. So we did a lot of moving up days. So I walked around the classroom with him, and we talked about all the different areas and things, just so he knew what was coming. We did a social story, which, um, I don't know if you guys know what the social stories are, but basically they are photographs of things that are going to happen, um, and how things are so the children can get their heads around them before they actually have to happen. Have you finished, Sazza? Yeah. You've finished, have you? Let me wipe your nose and get you out. Do you want to go and play? Yeah. You can play on the floor next to Mummy. Just get that right. Um, yeah, so a social story is a really, really good way of preparing children. So we had photographs of, uh, first of all, you know, when I go to school, I'll hang my coat here. There's a picture of where he's going to hang his coat and then where he's going to sit on the carpet and where he's going to go to the toilet. And, all that sort of stuff. Does I say hi? Does I say hello? You want your bunny? That's yeah. crazy on your dress. Yeah. Incidentally, this was Bella's dress and she was wearing it at nine months and Zara's only 20 months. You're still tiny, aren't you? You're tiny. Yes. You want your bunny? Okay, you go play with your bunny then. You can play on the floor. Good girl. Okay, where was I? Yeah, so social stories. So we had photos of where he was going to eat his lunch, photos of all of it, and then he was, um, then he did, um, they all did moving up days to reception, but he did a lot more of them. So I went in with him and he just, he went up to the classroom a few more times. 
and all that, his transition to reception was, you know, was great. He did so well, I was really proud of him. So all summer we read over this social story, so basically there were photos printed out and we read it together about what he was going to do every day and then he understood what was coming and because he understood what was coming, he was okay with it. I think this is why he's obsessed with Alton Towers, he knows we're going, we've been before, but I know he will enjoy this time more because he knows where, because we've been there before, he knows and understands it, and because he's obsessively researched it, he's sort of, I think he's got close to a photographic memory actually, um, because he's obsessively knows exactly where everything is, he'll, he will enjoy it so much more and he'll be so much happier. Um, so yes, how you can prepare them for change, just plan, 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 plan. Um, and structure. So, if um, uh, a visual timetable is really good. So, if and again, this stuff works for all children, not just children with autism. If all children like routine and all children do well with this stuff. So, if you could you, you could use these examples with your children that are not ASD, you know, not autism spectrum disorder, and it will help them. So, a visual timetable is literally just. Um, it's usually pictures so they can understand more pictures with words that's like first we'll clean our teeth then we'll get dressed and then we'll do this and then we'll do that and then so you take you can take these pictures down off and swap them around so okay so to you know if you've got to leave early to go to the airport or something so maybe your social story would say something like we get up at this time and then we have breakfast and then so on this specific day you're going to prepare them for you swap it around and say right we're going to get up much earlier and then we're going to drive somewhere then we're going to have breakfast for example and by preparing your child with um, a visual timetable and they can physically pick up the cards and move them around themselves Sarah what are you doing I can see you in the back of the mirror do you want to yes you can't go out there you need to stay here with mommy so I can watch you do you want to come back no okay She's fine. You play with the toy kitchen over here. Got a toy kitchen in the kitchen so she can help the cook. Okay, well, you can come and sit here with mummy or you can play with that. Why don't you watch Bane? Is that a good idea? It is a good idea. You watch Bane then. <laughs> so it won't be long. Mummy's just talking to these people and then I'll go and play with you, okay? I can't open the gate now because I've got to do this, okay? Good girl. Sorry, guys. You can cut to mummy if you like. Right, where were we? Let's see if we can get on to the next question, shall we? Right. Next question. Right, so we've got how did I realize I thought Brian had autism? <laughs> That's not dad, I have a picture of someone else. Right, um, so I've got my questions from Instagram printed out here. Right, so um, yeah, so how did I realize my gorgeous wife had autism? Now, I already just talked about the, um, the sort of red flags, but I'm just going to reiterate here, if you have any concerns at all, you are not going to be able to, as a parent, say, yes, it's autism, or no, it's not. Um, I don't think I've talked about this one here before, but um, I've recently got asked for the health visitor to refer my daughter, Bella, to um, go through the diagnosis process. I've always thought she was like so far from the spectrum that it was untrue. But she is starting to show some signs. So she's very, very different to Will. Um, but she's a girl. So girls and boys, by all accounts, through my reasonably extensive research, present very, very differently on the spectrum. Um, and they sort of uh, mask the social difficulties a lot more. Um, but she is starting to do some sort of quite repetitive, quite obsessive behaviour. So I've just come to the conclusion that there is no harm in checking it out you know the diagnosis process is, is it's quite extensive but it's not invasive it's not nasty it's basically they sit and play games with some very nice doctors and um, they chat to them she'll probably enjoy it so I know that I'll look back at this time in a few years time and either go well that was a something and nothing wasn't it that was me being clearly paranoid seeing autism everywhere or well good thing we looked into that um, now one thing I will say is in the UK, and I know in Wales, I can't speak for the rest of the country, but in Wales, that in, mm. if you've got a child that's approaching age five, I would seriously, seriously get, uh, and you've got any concerns at all, you need to get into the system and get a diagnosis or, you know, get through the diagnosis process before the age five. Because pre-age five, they are the health visitors problem, mm. and they are sort of under their jurisdiction. Um, so then you go through, you go under health. So you, uh, you go through the, the health visitor, they send you to a consultant locally, and then 
you get it. Uh, it goes through the diagnosis process. The, yes, you can see yourself and now you're beautiful. Are you beautiful? Yeah. Yes. Um, however, when you your child reaches age five, they then become education's problem, and education is massively underfunded. So in order to actually get anywhere near a specialist to try attempt to get a diagnosis past the age of five is nigh on, you know, it's not impossible, but it's a blooming uphill struggle. So if you have got a young child and you've got any concerns at all, speak to your health visitor, get them checked, there's no harm in it, honestly. Okay. So, main, so we've got how can I approach a child with autism without triggering their anxiety? Um, now, every single child and adult with autism is totally different. This is why it's called ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. So, it's such a broad, broad spectrum. Some children will, or adults will have issues with noise or with sensory things. Um, some don't like being touched, and some don't bother them at all. So really, um, if it's a child, I would speak to the parents because they're all different. You know, as humans, we're all different, aren't we? But um, every child, child with autism is different and will have different difficulties. Um, but just not being, I guess, not just um, not being too, totally sort of withdrawn or anything, but just approaching with caution and not being overly tactile, I would say. Um, so if, you, if, if it's not possible to speak to the parents first, then just avoid being overly tactile. Because I think that can make some children with autism um, a little bit um, anxious. Um, so perhaps not insist, you know, perhaps some children, maybe, you know, friends, uh, children for the first time, you might hug them or something. Just check the parents before do that, that they, that's not going to upset them. Um, so, let's have a look. Oh, we've got other questions. Have you seen Pablo on CBBS? It's designed to raise awareness. That's not a picture. That's not a picture of Dada. It doesn't even look like him. <laughs> have you watched a, a Pablo on CBBS? Is it designed? It is designed to raise awareness of autism. What do you think? Um, uh, yes, it is good that there is something on TV that is raising awareness of autism. My children, even a child with autism, to be honest, is the best on it. Um, they just find it a bit boring. So, maybe not the correct way thing to say, but yeah, they, um, I think it's good that there's a program raising, raising awareness, but um, yeah, they don't, they, they're not that into it. Um, so we've not watched it a great deal. We have seen it, we've not watched it a great deal. Um, so I'm, I'm glad there's something about uh, raising awareness, but no, they're, they're, not, they're just not fast. Um, okay. And then, right, what's the difference between autism and Asperger's? Asperger's, just, I never could say that. So, look, they're just little, look, she thinks that these little, hot, these little tiny pictures that you can't even see their faces, are pictures of Dada. Right, no, no, that's not a picture of Dada. Still not. Can you go get your bunny? Right, so, um, basically, Asperger's, or Asperger's, I still don't know how to say that, is just, autism spectrum disorder covers the whole thing. So. Um, I'm sure you've heard people say that most of us are on the spectrum somewhere, um, and it is a spectrum. Um, so the, the only diagnosis they give now is mild, moderate, or I can't remember the word they use, it might be extreme, oh, really sort of moderate autism. Um, Asperger's is a very specific set of um, behaviours and traits, which is, forms a very small section of the autism spectrum disorder. Um, now, by all accounts, in our trust in Wales, I don't know if it's the whole country, has stopped using the term Asperger's um, because Asperger's sort of is uh, associated with people that cope socially a lot better than most people with autism. By all accounts, people, that, the children that had this diagnosis, I really must learn how to say it, Asperger's or Asperger's, um, that had that diagnosis, have you got a bad ear? Have you? No. The children that had that diagnosis didn't access as much help as the children that did not have that diagnosis. Um, so they they stopped using it. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It, they just call it. So William might previously, I'm darling, have been diagnosed with that, but they stopped using it. What's the matter? Mama, what? You want to go in the kit? You want to go in the playroom? Yeah. Okay. Well, should we say goodbye to all these lovely people first? Yeah. But first we've got to tell people who the winner of the competition was, haven't we? Yeah. Okay, so I've just got a couple more questions I need to answer. Um, there we go. So how, what stage did I notice? Yeah, yeah so about one. Mama. From age one, Mama. I thought we noticed. Mama. In the two-year check. Mama. Mama. Yeah, that's Mama, isn't it? Yeah. 
in his two year check, he stood up and recited the alphabet, and they said, Yeah, no concerns here then. Um, but then, with hindsight, that is quite spiky development. You know, that's quite, um, he was very advanced for two in some areas and then falling behind in others. But um, especially very high functioning children like Will, the two year check checks will not pick up um, autism. They won't flag it up. Um, so they will, um, they're relying on parents to kind of come forward um, and notice the, the um, difficulties their own children are having. Do you want to go down? Yeah. You go and cook in that kitchen then. You go and do some cooking for mummy. Good girl. Okay, uh, there we go. My daughter's being obsessed at the moment. How do I explain autism to your child? She is 10. Okay. Um, this is how we've done it. Because, and the reason we had to um, explain it to Will was he had a band. Um, a lot of theme parks give out um, disability bands for people with autism because uh, one of the traits of autism is finding it difficult with things like queuing. So he had a band and he wanted to know why he had a band. So we've explained autism that um, everyone is different and there are some children in his class that really struggle to learn to read and they just can't do reading. And there are some children in his class that really struggle with maths. And he finds these things so easy. They're just so natural to him. He sees a word once, he understands it, and he can read it. Um, you know, maths, he does calculations in his head that spin me out. So he's, you know, he's very, very clever. But he struggles with other things. So we've just said that um, some everyone struggles with something, and he struggles with things like queuing. And he struggles with things like when um, other children... Um, don't play things the way he expects them to be played. And he struggles with things um, not going the way he expects them to go. Um, if Or plans changing or, or things being out of order. And autism just means struggling with those things and not struggling with the other things. So that's how we've explained it. If anyone's got a better way of explaining it to their children, please let me know because so far he's, you know, he's been quite accepting of that. And it, autism just means that he has different struggles to other children. So, yeah, that's what we've done. Um, right, uh, this may be too personal, but I'm intrigued. What sort of level on the spectrum is well that he has moderate autism? Um, which I was surprised at, actually. I thought he'd come back with mild, and they said moderate, and I was like, but, yeah, he's moderate autism. Um, I will say that if you met him now, you probably wouldn't notice. Uh, my objective was always to kind of manage his difficulties so that he he wouldn't sort of stand out as struggling and he wouldn't naturally struggle in every situation like he used to. And I think we're doing a really good job of that. We've got all these strategies that um, that we've put into place, which I won't start going into now because I'll, I'll just be here all day boring the, so the socks off you. But I will. I do intend to. I can do a different live on strategies um, a different day if you like. And um, I certainly intend to I get around to it and write it all up in a blog post. Um, yeah, so that, um, yeah, he's got moderate autism. So, um, yeah, the last thing I wanted to say was when I was, um, concerned, oh, hang on, right, I've got another question here. Does your son attend mainstream school and how supportive they've been? Yes, he does attend mainstream school and they've been amazing. Um, Obviously, just as when I was pregnant, I had some white midwives that are amazing, and some of you thought, why are you doing this job? Um, some schools are going to be better than others. Um, but yes, we've been incredibly, incredibly lucky. They've been amazing. Um, the teacher, he, he had one teacher through Rising Threes and Nursery and Reception, who was just so wonderful with him, and she just, you know, I knew she was sort of taking care of him so well for me, and that was wonderful. And then I was really nervous when he was going on to the next class. It was a new teacher I, I didn't know. And he um, he's had her for last year and now this year. And I'm just truly blessed that she's just been amazing with him as well, honestly. They're just, I cannot praise these, these people highly enough. They've been so good with them. And they really, they look out for him and they take care of him. And they, they put these strategies in place. And I know they'll ring me if there's any issues. And I feel comfortable sending him into school. Um, a slight panic at the set, but like a supply teacher, I'm like, ah, that's not what we were expecting, we didn't prepare him for this, but you know, but yeah, his, his school has been amazing and the teachers have been amazing. Um, so yeah, they were all the, I think they were all the questions. If there are any more questions, I'm gonna, I will go through the comments in a second. Um, if um, you do have any concerns, there was an amazing, amazing course that I watched and it was absolutely free 
on um, the Apple uh, lecture, the Apple courses and lectures are called iTunes U. So if anyone is interested in watching all those lectures, they were filmed for doctors in one of those big um, American um, medical schools. I know it was a good one because they mentioned it on Grey's Anatomy, so it must be true. Um, but yeah, these uh, they filmed these lectures that they are about autism that they did for actual doctors or trainee doctors. Um, and then they, they bugged them up on this um, iTunes U service, which was amazing. So I watched that and I learned so, so much from it. Um, and then, so if anyone wants the link to that, just send me a little inbox and I will um, find that link and send that over to you because I find that a massively helpful resource. Um, and then the very last thing I wanted to say before we announce the winner was that um, you've probably noticed as I've been talking, I don't say he is autistic. It's not something we say. Um, and this is personal preference, um, but I would, William is more than his autism. Um, so I don't say he is autistic because that's just like sticking a big label on top of him and saying that's what he is. It is part of him, just as I am um, a chocoholic, that is part of me. <laughs> um, but it's not all of me, you know, there, there's a lot more to me than that. Um, I am a blogger, but that's not all of me. It, there's more to me than that. So William has autism as opposed to is autistic. Um, so if you are um, talking about people with autism, it is nicer to say that if they have autism than they are autistic, I believe. Again, it's personal preference, but that's my preference. And I think that's like um, a nicer way to look at it because it just means that it's not your whole, it's, it's not your whole identity. So um, I'm going to very quickly now announce the winner of the giveaway. Now the giveaway, for those of you, uh, I think we announced, we opened the giveaway last week on live um, and it was my new collection of um, t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, bags, which I should, should grab one to show you really, should I should have been organised. Um, anyway, my new mummy collection which you can, you can check out over on the blog which is mummyfour.com and there's a link to the shop on the top of the toolbar. Um, so last week we launched a giveaway on Facebook and Instagram um, and you had to comment and let me know which item you wanted to win and then everyone was entered, um, everyone on Facebook and Instagram entered into a draw and we have got the winner to announce to you today. So, drum roll please, drum roll while I get you the winner and the winner is Georgina Swain, congratulations. I will be DMing you uh, when I get off this broadcast to let you know if you're not on this broadcast already to let you know um, to let you know that you are the winner and to arrange getting your prize to you. So um, I am going to. I think we've covered. I don't think there's anything on Facebook that we need to address. So I'm going to sign off there and go. Th and I'll, go I'll go through the Instagram comments, which I can't see at the moment because they're behind my laptop. So um, thank you very much for everyone that joined me on Facebook. I will see you all next week at the same time. Bye.